Hi, everybody. This is Nancy Novak, Chief Innovation Officer at Compass Data Centers, and welcome to the next episode of Extending the Ladder. Today, we have with us the wonderful San Diego State University. We have three amazing students, and I would love for them to be able to introduce themselves with a little bit of information about each one of them. So please give us your field of study, any experience you have in the field, how did you get interested in the STEM trades? And then what are your goals in this chosen field? Let's start with you, Danny. Thank you. Um, my name is Danny. I am currently pursuing a master's degree at SDSU and doing civil engineering with a specialty in water resources. My current research is on modeling post-fire vegetation management effects on urban stream systems. And I also did my undergrad at Colorado School of Mines in Geotechnical Engineering, entered the workforce uh, in January, and I am working currently as a civil design engineer as well for a small engineering firm. Um, so getting my hands in a lot of different things. I was first, I guess, drawn to STEM. I was really good at math. And I am very competitive and honestly just wanted to do something impressive. And I ended up really liking it. So I'm really enjoying where I'm at right now. And uh, future goals, I actually would really like to learn more about the business side of engineering and moving forward after mastering the design and technical side. I'd really like to move into management and get to hopefully be a part of running a business someday. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Danny. How about you, Lily? Hi, my name is Lilia Stete, and I'm a fourth year PhD student at San Diego State. So I finished my bachelor's degree at San Diego State in environmental engineering. And unlike Denny, I was not good at math. Um, not that I know of anyway. Um, so I actually was in the military years ago. And uh, when I was getting out of the military, they gave me an aptitude test and told me I'd be a good engineer. I thought they were crazy. Turns out that I am a good engineer. So I'm in environmental engineering and I do research on sanitation systems. Um, so these are different types of on-site sanitation systems that are used to provide access to sanitation or toilets for people that live all around the world without access to good barriers to prevent public health issues and also um, to minimize the impact on the environment. So I work with a lot of different systems. I've worked on a waterless flushing toilet for mobile sanitation units to provide unhoused community members with access to a toilet. And I'm currently working on patenting a device for improving wow. septic systems. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Lily. And Juliet, how about you? Hi, yes, my name is Juliet Livanos. I'm in my last year at San Diego State University. I'm studying construction engineering. I currently work at Belford Reedy as a virtual design and construction intern. And then before that, I was a project engineer intern at a construction site. Um, I'm president of the AGC CMA student chapter, which stands for Associated General Contractors Construction Management Association of America. In regards to getting into STEM, I think it was just the fact that I did pretty well in math and science too. So I figured why not go into a field like that? Also, I feel like my parents kind of encouraged me to pursue something like that. And then lastly, for my goals, I think I just wanna integrate technology in the construction industry um, and kind of just find more efficient solutions to building in addition to just staying involved with my alma mater because I, I got a lot from my program at San Diego State. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's a great program there. I can attest to that. The reason I wanted to go through these introductions is just to really frame, you know, the diversity we have on the call. Um, everybody is in kind of, you know, similar fields, but different fields and different stages throughout your academic and work careers. So I really feel like this is going to give us a great um, perspective when we ask certain questions about, you know, for our audience about the industry that, you know, they might be interested in entering or are already in. So I would love to, you know, what we're going to do is a bit of a round robin here. And um, I kind of want to talk about, in the beginning, let's hit it right off the bat, some of the challenges that you all have encountered in this male-dominated field. And um, and I can give some examples of these challenges just kind of off the bat, but you don't have to, you know, if any one of those resonates with you, I would love to hear from you just kind of like, you know, which ones um, you would like to you know, impart wisdom and experience and maybe, you know, some thoughts about for the audience. So challenges, you know, that are typical in this um, industry would be things like 
either sexual harassment or even, um, you know, sexual biases, imposter syndromes, implicit biases, and then possibly just, you know, behaviors within the industry um, when it comes to like, you know, being able to hear your voice and have authority and those types of things. So if, if you guys wouldn't mind, you know, kind of giving me some feedback on one or the other, then maybe we can dig into, you know, one of the ones that would resonate really well with the audience, one or two of those. Danny, it'd be wonderful if you could start us out. I guess I, guess I would say I was lucky enough. Uh, I grew up with a lot of boys um, and I was the only girl. So um, I've always been relatively comfortable with uh, men and I had to, I had to learn very quickly how to defend myself and um, how to be competitive, be a competitor, and to stand up for myself around people who may look down on you or may not. I've been really lucky and that I'm surrounded with a lot of really good men in my workplace that I haven't experienced a lot of. I don't know if you want to call it like coming against me because or look someone looking down on me be just because I'm a woman. I've actually been given a lot of things simply because I'm the only woman there or whatever. My perspective, I think, is a little bit different on it, but I definitely would always want to say, like, I have a lot of friends who have a lot of different stories, and I think it's important not to walk into a room and assume that you're going to be looked down on um, because you're a woman. But also, I always had to come to an understanding, like, if someone thought of me in the workplace as lesser because I'm a female, that's their problem. Um, that's their problem. That's their thought. Uh, for me, I, I kind of take it as a motivating factor. Um, I like to encourage a lot of people to, or a lot of women, like, don't let it put you down. Like, this is the way it is. And if we're going to start somewhere, uh, we got to start by motivating ourselves to be like, hey, okay, you think I'm less because I'm a woman, then I'm going to show you that I'm way better than any of these men in here. <laughs> um, so I kind of have that kind of outlook on it. So I've never had like a situation that really put me down before, um, but I do like to to encourage encourage women. You well, have good advice. Honestly, it really is. I mean, because statistically, you know, we're mm -hmm. very underrepresented, and there's and there's reasons for that, right? Um, and the reasons are all valid reasons, but um, I think that's good advice. You know, as far as you know, having the that kind of mentality, I like it because you know I'm a lot older than you all, and. Um, it was a little bit more explicit than the old days, and it was a, kind of a different world, right? 30 years ago was a long, long time ago in construction years. So. <laughs> but um, but I, I do have to say, like, I, I'm always fascinated because, you know, we're trying to figure out how to advance and bring more of our gender into the industry. And there's still statistically a big problem with that. So there's reasons that we want to be able to overcome. And that's why I like you. You know, this type of feedback, this type of advice, and just still being plugged into what's actually happening in the field. And I, I want to, before I go on to Lily, I wanted to say the biases that exist, um, especially the implicit biases in most um, industries, especially, you know, and construction is um, definitely one of them. The implicit biases are usually done with good intentions. So it's somebody who's systemically brought up in a certain way who makes decisions on your behalf. Um, with sometimes without you even knowing it, right? And it's not even something that they're aware of. Um, so, so we have to keep that in mind that it doesn't mean there's no nefarious characters everywhere trying to, um, you know, cut you off. But, but it can happen because this is just human nature, and as humans, we all have biases, right? So, um, I wanted to frame a little bit about that. It's not about complaining; it's more about just kind of understanding and um, elevating the the conversation. So, Lily, let, let's hear from you on this. Yeah, I actually resonated with what Danny was saying because I have noticed that um, women in STEM are there because they like a challenge. So if that challenge is math or science or technical issues or, you know, other people's opinions of us, we're going to overcome that. So I have noticed actually throughout my entire time in STEM, and I've looked this up several times, um, like psychology articles, like social science articles that actually cover that um, women actually do perform better in STEM or they work harder in STEM. I've noticed it personally, I had to look it up. Um, and I think that is kind of a conditioned response, but whether it is or it isn't, um, it doesn't matter because we come in and we know it's stacked against us or maybe we assume what's stacked against us and we're gonna overcome it. So we work really hard and we kick ass. As far as imposter syndrome goes, I had it really bad. I have experienced it really bad over my time, but I have been in so many 
places, so many spaces that I never thought I would be and I didn't think were open for access to women or just any other demographic that I fit. I always felt like I didn't belong there. They're going to discover me, right? But I have found over the years that for as many people as I thought were smarter than me, um, better than me in their careers, or I, I could never be at their level, or I didn't belong in the room with them, people also see me that way. So once you start to demonstrate your skills, your knowledge, um, your experience, like you are the person that people feel yeah. an impo- are right. like an imposter around. So that kind of has suppressed this feeling for me, really. Um, one, seeing that I've accomplished a lot because I work hard and I've overcome all of those challenges. And two, that sometimes I'm the expert. That's true. That's, that was uh, one of the things that um, we mentioned when we talked earlier, and that was, you know, if you look around at your peers, typically you can kind of figure out that you know as much or more than, than they do uh, once you get into a position. And like really trying to, like you said, benchmark yourself against them is helpful because, again, you know, there will be situations where it's, the roles are reversed and you know that you're an expert on it, um, you know. And so I, I, that's, again, very good and very confident and wonderful advice. We're all imposters and we're all faking it until we make it. Love it. Before we move on to Julia, I wanted to ask a quick question about STEM. Okay. So I love the STEM field and I'm interested in how we've really highlighted this because we are going through the fourth industrial revolution of digitizing everything on the planet. And that means the humanities are now digital as well, right? So photography, art, music, literature, all digital. So there's STEM components to both the humanities and the sciences and technologies and engineers and math, right? So my question is, and this is um, something too, Juliet, that you don't have to answer right off because you still have to get to the challenges, right? But my, my question was, you know, this diversity of bringing um, our gender more into our industry, I'm, I'm hoping is going to help us pull some of the humanities back into STEM. And Lily, I think your project is a perfect example of that, right? Because you're working on ways in which you can solve for human problems through the use of STEM. So understanding cognitively what's going on when we're making these decisions in technology or engineering and, and using math to do that, I think is something that we should, you know, kind of strive towards. So instead of just focusing on STEM, you know, bringing those humanities forward and, and having that blend and hoping that our gender kind of helps that blend get to be where um, there's more equal parts to it. Julia, let's hear from you about your challenges, and then we can have a little bit of discussion about, you know, the kind of the lenses that, that our, uh, our gender will bring to this industry. Yeah, so my experience, I think, is um, pretty similar to Danny and Lily in the sense that I um, kind of got used to being around men. I think even, like, learning how to weightlift, I got used to just being around a lot of testosterone and kind of just learning how to navigate that. <laughs> But um, I think another experience, too, is the fact that um, I, so I'm president of this club and all the other eight members are men. So it's kind of just learning how to put myself in a leadership or a role of a leader and learning how to delegate to men. It can kind of be a little challenging. So I think that was something for me to kind of learn how to navigate. I think another thing, too, is that just being on site, too, I learned that Sometimes I'm seen as a woman first instead of just a worker on the field. I think one time I, that kind of really put things in perspective because I was just talking to this um, person who was part of the trades and he asked me like, oh, have you been harassed yet? And it was kind of just like something that I wasn't really expecting to be asked. I didn't think was appropriate to be asked, but it was kind of just like a, a moment for me to take a step back and realize, okay, like this stuff still kind of does happen sometimes. So. I think for me, it's kind of just keeping an eye out for that kind of stuff too. Yeah, and if you look, if you look at the surveys that Catalyst and McKinsey have done, you know, it is actually very prevalent in um, still more than sixty percent of the of the uh, folks that they survey that they that they experience some form of harassment. So it's that it's a serious thing that we should all take um, you know to heart. And I love being able to be you know glasses half full, kind of positive about the changes that have happened in the industry because it has gotten much, much better, but it's still something that we have to take diligent about. Um, and I, I did want to mention, you know, there is a wonderful program um, that the Steel, uh, Steel Union has, and it's called Be That One Guy. 
So it's really about getting the advocacy from our male counterparts and speaking up and not staying complicit when they do see things that are going awry or something that's inappropriate in the, in the field. You got one guy that stands up and advocates and amplifies, you know, for the, for the women, for their women coworkers. Um, and it, anyone can look that up. It's a, it's a fantastic and very successful program that they started. So yeah, so I, you know, some of the things we talked about earlier when we, before when we got onto the, the live uh, podcast here was, you know, like the behaviors and stuff when, when we're trying to like, you know, really have the voice of authority or be heard in a room and some of the tips um, in order to be able to do that. And I think it's, it's, it's worth talking about because, you know, I experienced this myself. I, I'll never forget. It was way late in my career um, when I was a national VP where I had one of my um, one of my regional VPs say to me that they thought I was, um, you know, getting excitable or getting emotional. And I remember at the time just pausing and saying, you know, when I'm when I'm really, you know, excited about any initiative and, you know, use the word passion, use motivated, whatever you want to use. Um, I have a tendency to speak faster and I, my octave might go up a little bit, right? And sometimes that gets received as, you know, being, you know, emotional, excitable, whatever you want to call it, right? Something that's uncomfortable for the person receiving it. So I just basically said, this is what happens when, when I'm excited about an initiative and my, it's in my DNA and I have no control over it. Um, but so we, I think we just need to, you know, get, get used to it, right? And it was a fantastic conversation that I wish I could have told myself, you know, 15 years earlier, but um, it worked out really well because it was all about getting to know the individual that I'm working with. And it's no different than like understanding someone's sense of humor or someone's, you know, um, tolerance for risk or someone's, you know, the way that we receive people is getting to know them better, right? And that's really where I think the challenge is, we're getting to know each other on more of a personal an organic level as well as a professional level. And, and what I've found is where I kind of want your feedback from all of you is where there's been situations where we've had to like, you know, change ourselves of the way we speak, the way we dress, the way we walk, the way we do certain things so that we get received differently versus being able to just be our true individual selves and being able to like, you know, explain that um, it, it's hard. Because a lot of times you don't have the opportunity to explain it. And so you're trying to get in that room, right, and have a voice. And I just would love to hear from you all about um, those types of experiences. Awesome. Um, it's really neat, actually, because I never really was able to put it into words or, or think about it, but of the how I act differently. Like if I'm in a room full of men versus like a room full of women. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I do do that. Like, uh, for sure do that. And I never really thought of it very deeply, but um, I have that kind of same issue where I am a very emotional person and I'm very, I get really excited and I find myself sometimes and my coworkers are awesome. Like they never make me feel this way, but I do feel like I'm an, like, like the only woman on my team. And I'm like, as, I'm like, Hey, don't get emotional. Don't get emotional. Like contain it. Don't, don't, don't let it out. You know? And um, I think that, yeah, like there is a time and a place for it. Like I try to stay professional, try to be, you know, but like, where is that line between like being myself and then still maintaining like professionalism as a woman? I think I'm still trying to learn that. And I find myself, I swear a lot more when I'm around men. I don't know if that's just to like exert my dominance. I don't know, <laughs> but like uh, I tend to do that because I don't really swear that much, but I find myself like, yeah, uh, sometimes when I'm talking to men, it comes out a lot easier than up <laughs> I feel Danny, I feel you. Don't worry. I definitely have that same thing of like, oh, I'm, I'm like getting too emotional. I like guess this is not the right place for it, but also like I still want to maintain like me. I would love to hear everyone else's perspective because I think I'm still learning. It's thought provoking. It really is. And again, mm. it's not about like being able to solve it just today. It's about just kind of thinking about it and understanding it and then, you know, figuring out different ways that we can, you know, handle or manage that. So Lily, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I definitely have adopted behaviors to assert my position in spaces where there are mostly men, or I'm also concerned about sexual harassment. So before I go places, I think about how I'm going to do my hair, how I'm going to do my makeup so that I present fine or well, but I'm not inviting unwelcomed comments, um, what I'm going to wear even down to like the type of bra that I wear because, you know, how much support am yeah. I trying to, you know? So outside of that, I've adopted other behaviors like a walk 
the way I look at people, the way I talk. And mine is, I mean, if I'm comfortable, yeah, it definitely gets into some vulgar language. But <laughs> when I'm not, it's more of like a stone wall, you know? I'm I'm showing you, like, you know, you're not going to get past this professional interaction. It, it's not going any further than this. But as far as you were saying with, like, the passion, this getting excited and everything, um, I have been called a bulldog and in my field. Um, I am, yeah, okay. I'm definitely the type of person that if I'm passionate about something, I get very serious about it. I have a very um, strong boundary between what's right and wrong to me. And I think as people who have faced adversity, that we are often very empathetic about these things. And I mean, let's be real, STEM, all most actually, I guess all STEM disciplines have implications for people's lives. You should be passionate about this. There's no room really, in my opinion, for tone policing when it comes down to really what's right and wrong and I know there's like a gray area for the old boys but for for me there's just really not. I was gonna say I was like oh I just find I would find that inappropriate so you know I I've never been personally called out for that but if I had uh had been then I probably would have said like don't you want someone to, to give uh, a crap about that's, this that's you good. know excellent point of view really appreciate that I have learned something and I I do like that term Julia, how about you? So I think behavior-wise, I do see myself kind of changing how I am based off of who I'm around, especially like with men. I, when I'm like shaking hands, I try to have a very firm handshake, whereas with women, I'm not too concerned with that. Um, or even like going to construction sites, I tend to wear like baggier clothes. I kind of just want to blend in. I'm like a five, one, five foot one woman, so I mean, there's only so much blending in I can do, but. Yeah, I definitely do try to kind of adjust how I behave just because I don't want to stand out too much and be called out for certain situations. So I think that's kind of how I've chose to. That makes a lot of sense. And I do think the handshake is, is, is a big one too. And, and I'll be perfectly honest, like here's my implicit bias. I actually kind of judge people by their handshake sometimes. I mean, you know, like a firm handshake to me is a very welcoming handshake. And, and it's just, but sometimes culturally, it's just so different. And I don't know if you guys remember the story, but when we were on our pre-call, we talked about, you know, again, this presence of authority and this assumed authority, because sometimes you don't really have the opportunity to get to know um, the group or the person that you're going to deal with for very long. So um, way back when, earlier in my career, I literally would go and buy refurbished suit coats, like old men's suit coats, and wear those on the job versus the Carhartt or, you know, some type of jacket. So it would appear that I had more authority so that I would get treated with as more of a management level versus, you know, just some, one of the, one of the workers out there. And, um, it was somewhat effective, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but again, it was just like the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we walk. I mean, it is about like, I, you know, if I don't have a lot of time and I just want to have my voice heard, you know, sometimes I do these things because it helps me get to where I need to go. But I did want to point out too, like for the male audience, um, that we have, then there are ways that you can advocate for and amplify the women in your in your group and in your on your team and in the industry. And that is, you know, again, to be that one guy who sees and recognizes, you know, what's happening and just is supportive and make sure that our voices get heard. Because as you've seen with this fantastic group of women here, um, having our voices heard is going to make a big difference in um, in society and in the world. Speaking of that, and that will segue really beautifully into mentorship and advocacy. I would love to kind of understand a little bit more about, you know, how that's been for you all in your career, both academic and professionally. And I really want to dive in a little bit, Juliet, on your role as president of the of the of the construction club for AGC, um, and you know what that's been doing for you in your career, and how that relates maybe back to mentorship and advocacy with women and with men. In regards to um, kind of just having an advocate. I really have to give a shout out to my professor Alvis and Professor McCory. Both of them have been extremely passionate women that I've witnessed in the construction industry. They've shown me what it means to be empowered and knowledgeable and kind of just own your role. Uh, I think that it wasn't until I actually went into construction that I saw how much support is offered to students and I really took advantage of that because they really have helped me navigate um, just situations um, throughout my career in, in college. 
Just going back to like the AGC CMA student chapter, Professor Alves is my advisor, so she's always there to kind of give guidance and she's always someone I can count on to ask questions. So I think that kind of just goes a really long way for kind of helping me navigate how, what's best for um, other students that are a part of the club and kind of wanting to get more career involvement. Um, and I've been able to make a lot of, create a lot of relationships and network significantly through that club. So it's been a, a huge blessing for me, I think. That's fantastic. And that's great advice too, to get involved in organizations that are all about, you know, the advancement of women in the industry or just in the industry themselves, right? Whether it's a blended, um, you know, group or not. Like those kind of organizations are going to build those relationships. And I'm so happy that you found this great mentors there. That's fantastic. Lily, do you want to give us your perspective about advocacy and mentorship? Sure. As far as being a woman in STEM, since I was about to finish my bachelor's degree, so all of my professional experiences have been led by women in engineering. I worked for two years under a really supportive mentor right before I finished my bachelor's degree. So I wasn't really young, but I was younger. She was one of the people who really taught me to like fight for myself and advocate for myself, um, stick up for myself when other um, males in the office were either sexually harassing me to like actually report it because, well, I was in the military, you know, it, that it's not the same culture. You don't really talk about those things, you know, um, unfortunately. She was like, no, you have to say something, you know? So she taught me how to to actually stick up for myself in that sense. And then also with um, a male in our office who was kind of aggressive in his approach with me. Um, and I'm not sure what that was about, but she was like, you know, you do a great job and you need to recognize that. She always said, you have a gold star. All you need to do is polish it. So then I, I worked under um, another female engineer um, and additionally my advisor that I've had for the last four years. And the, the one thing I really appreciate about them is that they, they're always there for support, but they really kind of send me out there to, to figure things out on my own. It's like being a kid in a pool, but your mom has you on one of those like old leashes from the 90s you know like they're they're there but they're like you got to figure it out on your own um and it's really like helped mold me and um form me into someone that's really independent um at working and very competent in my field so it's almost like uh, like a mama bird who kind of like you know they they you have to figure out how to fly i'm not gonna like fly you yeah they they're like okay here's how i did it you do it, you can do it, and they're very supportive in that way. Yeah, I'm right here if you need me. I think that's great. I think my, my dad did a lot of that for me, and I think it does help you when you get into the field because it gives you that sense of confidence, which is super important. And Danny, let's finish up with you on the mentorship and advocacy because I think it's so important. And if you wouldn't mind, I think it's I think it'd be nice to, you know, kind of if we if you have any stories about it, but just like that whole organic conversation, like that happens on the golf course. Like, you know, how does that really build deeper relationships and ability, ability basically for our coworkers and our superiors to mentor and advocate for us? So as mentorship goes, I actually have only had one female advisor, which was for my, my master's, um, Dr. Kinoshita, and I, she's amazing and has been uh, a great supporter of me and she's currently having her second baby so she's just a total awesome go-getter and she's doing things and having a family and uh it's just really cool to see um how strong she is through everything and um all the rest of my advisors through my education have been men and also the men I think as well in my family taught me so much about like my worth and they picked me up when I was down and they taught me how to be independent and that how to be a go-getter and to go and go forward and not let anything and bring you down. And I think having their support uh, really kind of shaped me as well. Just having men around that did that for me. I wish I would have had maybe a little bit more um, of women in STEM as a mentor, because I think I would have been able to talk more about like this kind of thing. It does help me see like how important it is to to have mentorship and specifically a female like in your in your field. And I and I do think that it's important to note like honestly it's it's about that networking and being able to like really draw on different experiences and different backgrounds and different lenses and oh, yeah, the conversations, right? Yeah. Um, but we actually golfing is a great way to talk conversations. Yeah. 
<laughs> One of those ways where you spend hours with someone organically and things come up that would not come up in a business meeting or, you know, in a, in a circumstance where you had your staff or your family member or somebody with you. So, yeah. and it's human nature to advocate for those you know the best, right? It, it just is. I mean, I do it. I did it when I was, you know, when I was promoting people. Um, if I knew more about an individual, how they, the decision-making process was, things like that, you tend to advocate for them. So it's a little bit more of a challenge for women when there is a male-dominated sort, you know, environment, but, it, but it's not unworkable. You just have to really be conscious of making sure those things happen. And, and let's hope that the, if any of the firms are listening, it doesn't have to be on a golf course or in a bar. There are other ways to organically be together and get to know each other. And that's really where I think the challenge would be, um, would be you know, easier to overcome if they could make those environments for us. So but let's finish up here uh, quickly with um, basically just like, what would you guys like to see change for future generations coming into our industry? Anything, if you had this crystal ball and you knew it was gonna happen, and you could have done something differently or you wanted, you know, something to be different in your experience, what would that have been? Let's start out with you, Lily. Yeah. So this actually kind of touches on um, what we were just talking about with this mentorship thing. And um, for me, it's really important that I extend that to the people who are coming into my field after me. So I'm especially an advocate for women in STEM, but also anyone from minority groups. But that hasn't been something that I've experienced everywhere I've gone. And so, you know, that's called gatekeeping in the social world. And I think one thing I would change is that when I'm around or I'm in spaces and I see that I'm in a group and we are some of the only women in the room, it would be nice for us to kind of uplift each other. I've had a lot um, be, they all, they want to be the only woman there, you know, um, they, they think that they're, they're the only so one who makes who's, me sad when I hear that. I get very sad about that. Yeah, they think that they're the only one who's worked harder than everyone to get there to be the only woman in the room with the men. They they think that they are smarter than you. And, you know, especially when you kind of let loose a little bit um, for some of the women that I've encountered, especially at um, I go to two universities and um, UCSD is my other school. It's a research school, very like high prestige. And, you know, and the the women I've encountered there were really the ones that were very cold with me and wanted to leave everyone else in the dust. Sometimes I wonder if um, society hasn't created that problem by, by you know, only making room for one at the table uh, versus, you know, like strength and numbers kind of thing. So that's a, that's an interesting thing to think about because it is sad. And um, I sure wish that that could get better. Yeah. Yeah. It's not their fault whatsoever. But um, I just wish that that things could be different so that we don't feel threatened in a way that we have to uh, be that one person there and, and gatekeep the opportunities from other people. We should definitely be uplifting each other and sharing these experiences with one another. Thank you so much for that. Danny. I couldn't. Uh, Lily was spot on. I mean, I honestly, unfortunately, have seen. A lot of situations I have it shared them personally, but with some of my really good friends in the industry of of it's a woman against woman type of thing because they're just like they get uh, maybe it's a competitive thing with each other um, because there's not very many. And I think it's so important to to lift each other up and and to push each other forward. And I just I totally back that up. Like I said, I've had a very, really not great experience with the men in my workplace. Um, I I wouldn't necessarily want to change anything but I do got to figure out how to get more women in there that I don't know <laughs> it's uh I think taking the right steps forward yeah I mean, sometimes I have to say like you know it's one of those things where we reflect internally and say this has worked out well for me but then if you look externally at the statistics something doesn't feel right here something needs to change overall where I think you're you know you're giving back like this podcast is an example of Thing, you know, like that we need to be more inclusive because they, you know, inclusivity and diversity equals more innovative thought. If you have more innovative thought, you solve problems, including problems that are, you know, worldly problems, right? And if you solve more problems, you become more profitable and build more profitable, you can solve more problems. It's just this really wonderful cyclical way of doing things. So we need to be more inclusive. And Juliet, I would love to hear your thoughts on this before we finalize our wonderful episode of Extending the Ladder, which is exactly what we're talking about when it comes to mentorship, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. So kind of just going based off of what you said about having women kind of bring a new perspective and kind of innovative solutions, I really, really agree with that. I think that one way that that can be accomplished is by having more women superintendents. I think that they kind of bring a, a really special um, set of skills to problem solve, especially out on the field. And I feel like that's a little bit lacking right now. So I would really, really love to see more women superintendents. Oh my gosh, that's such a good, that's such a good point. That's a good point. Joanna. Right? Yeah. Okay. I love seeing um, women operators on the site. Um, I love seeing women superintendents. I kind of like get starstruck seeing women superintendents and kind of just creating a space for women to feel comfortable and welcome and just empowered in this space where they're expected to kind of just um, hone their, their skills and their passions in, in the industry. Excellent. If there's one thing I would always want to put out there, it's that um, I think that most women, what they want in this field is to be seen the same as everyone else. So we should be looking at men and women the same, and we would like for people to look at us the same. So that means if you wouldn't make that comment to a man, don't make it to me in a professional space. If you would not look at a male doing the same work and think that um, his competence is not at the level that I expect, but you, you do feel that way because it's a woman, then that's wrong. Just change your lens of me. Imagine I'm a man and then rethink yeah. your response. No, Lily, to me. you can it's spot on. If you can mentally role reverse, most of the time you'll know whether what you're saying is, uh, is appropriate, right? Or, or fits. And I think that's really a really good way of putting those lenses on. Um, I was going to say, we just did a podcast with Kavri Schmidt from Hensel Phelps, who's the superintendent on a $100 million project. And I just, this all resonated so much. And it's interesting to me because she's, she's so good at about like, you know, bringing her own perspective to the leadership role, which is different, but it's celebrating the differences and enjoying the differences and understanding differences are okay. But you're right, Lily, we don't want to be received and treated you know, as this or that, we want to be treated as a superintendent or a manager or a professor or whatever, or an engineer, you know, not female engineer, female manager, right? We want, or that sort of thing. We want to just, you know, let's, let's neutralize that and let's be treated as professionals um, in the same way. So I think that's a great way to close our extending the latter podcast. And I just so appreciate all of your perspectives. Thank you so much for being on the show.